Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Olivia Nathan, and I am honored to serve as your moderator today. Our conversation for the next hour will dive into COVID-19 and how it's affecting the LGBTQ plus community. Today's event comes to you through Equitas Health Institute in partnership with Stonewall Columbus, HRC Cincinnati, and our partners at the Greater Dayton LGBTQ plus center. So thank you for your collaboration. I currently serve as a staff pharmacist for Equitas Health. Please you yourself if you are currently not on mute. I currently serve as a staff pharmacist for the Equitas Health King Lincoln Pharmacy. Equitas Health is a non-for-profit with more than 19 locations in Ohio and Texas. Our services are broad and they include primary and specialty care, behavioral health, advocacy, Ryan White, and HIV prevention, just to name a few. In my role, I provide preventative care through vaccinations, lead community outreach focus in underserved communities, and advise patients on how to manage their chronic diseases with a primary focus on those at risk of HIV. Um, we are recording almost all of our content our panel today will break down the complex information we all need to know about COVID-19, how to prevent it, how to manage this unpredictable infection if we get sick, and to learn about vaccine safety. So for our audience members today, there'll be three key areas. Area one will be prevention, area two will be disease management, and the third area will be vaccine safety and access. Please place your questions in the Zoom chat box or Facebook comment section we have time at the end of the hour to address any questions that you may have. We are joined today by a distinguished group of experts. I would like to welcome first Dr. Chad Braun, if you could wave to our audience members today. He is the Chief Medical Officer for Equitas Health. In his role, he oversees Equitas Health's medical operations, strategy, and patient care. For the last four years, he has been leading Equitas Health's unique approach to addressing the healthcare needs of HIV positive, LGBTQ, and other medically underserved populations. We are also joined today by Dr. Carlos Malvasudo. He is the Assistant Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at The Ohio State University. He is a clinical investigator at the OSU AIDS Clinical Trials Unit and a principal investigator of multiple clinical trials in HIV, hepatitis C, and COVID-19. His areas of clinical research include cardiovascular complications of HIV and the use of broadly neutralizing antibodies for HIV treatment and cure, as well as the use of monoclonal antibodies to treat COVID-19 and improving access to HIV, hepatitis C, and COVID-19 treatment for underserved populations. We are also humbled to be joined by Brandon Chapman, as well as Jeffrey Wolf, who will share their experiences with the vaccine as well as COVID-19. People will care what you know when they know that you care. And so I wanna thank you all for showing your commitment to the care for this community and being here today. Dr. Ron, welcome again and thank you for joining us. We have been in quarantine for almost a year now and our understanding of COVID-19 is constantly evolving. Health professionals are urging us to remain diligent in wearing our masks, hand washing, and to stay six feet apart. How important is it, Dr. Braun, to adhere to these behaviors as the vaccine continues to become readily available in our communities? Hi, Olivia. Um, thanks so much um, for, for, for doing this, and thanks, everyone, uh, for, for um, the, the panelists and for everyone joining us today. Uh, our, our primary opportunities, opportunities right now to stop the spread of COVID as the vaccine rolls out, continue to be masking, socially distancing, and, and hand washing. So COVID is a um, virus that's spread primarily through respiratory droplets. So as simple as you know, coughing, sneezing, and even things like singing or talking or being around people in, in close proximity are how, how this virus is spread. So even as, and it's important, and, and Dr. Malvasio is gonna talk a lot more about the vaccine later, but 
vaccination will, will de significantly decrease the number of COVID cases that we have, but it, it doesn't mean that the virus can't spread anymore. So it's a, it's a big tool. Um, but as we're, as we're rolling out vaccinations, we want to continue to stick with what we know works. Um, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what kind of a mask probably would be an important thing to look at. So, you know, cloth masks that are, that are um, three layer are optimal. Uh, surgical masks, if you have access to those uh, in the community. Uh, and then there, you know, you'll see things like KN95 masks and N95 masks that are primarily used by uh, providers that come into contact with patients that have COVID or, or may have COVID or are doing procedures, those really aren't necessary for the lion's share of people out in the community. So as you hear a lot more about masking lately, uh, as we're moving into more contagious variants, but just sticking with what we know works is important and it will be continued to, uh, it will remain important throughout the summer. That's really good information. And so for folks who um, are looking to get tested, so say they're experiencing symptoms, there is an array of tests and I know that it can be confusing. So there are viral tests as well as antibody tests. Could you let us know when it's appropriate to get which and um, how we should kind of go through that process? Yeah, so they, the two and, and, and um, Dr. Malvacito can jump in if I'm saying anything out of school here, but I can tell you a little bit about how we do it at Equitas with our testing. And so you have the rapid antigen test, which we have, which is most effective if used in somebody that is uh, symptomatic. So if you're symptomatic and you have a positive rapid antigen test, which comes back in about 30 minutes or so, that's, that's a pretty good answer that you have COVID. If you're not symptomatic, uh, a PCR test, which tests for the actual virus, um, is the, the, the test that turns around in, in one to you know, five days, depending on volume uh, anymore, though we're getting a lot better at about probably one to two or one to three days now, um, that, that, that's the better test to use. So if, if you don't have symptoms and you've had an exposure or you feel like you might be traveling and you want to get a test um, and you want to be sure that at that time, at least, that you don't have COVID, the PCR test is a better test. Another question that we get a lot is, I've had an exposure, I'm not symptomatic, when should I get tested or should I get tested? The answer is yes, you should get tested. And we can talk about what an exposure really is, but the answer is yes, you should get tested. Uh, and ideally it would be about five days after the exposure would give you the, the best chance of having that let you know if that exposure was leading to a, an actual COVID infection. Awesome. We do have a slide that's gonna demonstrate the, the data for this next question, but I did want to ask in terms of the state of COVID-19 in Ohio, where are we? Are we experiencing higher rates of COVID-19? Are we kind of plateauing? Where are we in the state? Uh, right now in Ohio, we're, we're, we're doing better than we had been. So hospitalizations have been down uh, over, the, uh, over at least the last two weeks. Um, our case rates are down and our positivity rates are down right now. So at, at the moment, and uh, we, we are improving in Ohio, uh, and that's reflected in the change in the governor's um, curfew and some of the, the stay-at-home orders. Um, but that, that improvement is, is precarious. It depends on what we're doing, it, continuing to um, do mitigation strategies, strategies like we talked about at the start, getting vaccinated, and then figuring out how much um, of the new variants might affect uh, our rates in Ohio. Awesome. Dr. Brown, from your perspective, how has COVID-19 affected the LGBTQ plus community? And are we seeing more cases in this community? Uh, I don't know that we're seeing more cases in the, I wouldn't be able to comment on if we're seeing more cases uh, in the community uh, than, than, um, than outside of um, the LGBTQ community. Um, so I, I, I don't know the, the answer to that really, Olivia. I, what I do know is that um, in people living with HIV, uh, outcomes with COVID infection have, have been comparable to age and comorbid uh, matched patients that, that don't have HIV. So, um, and I think that Dr. Malvestuda was planning on talking a little bit about that later, but that is um, one of the, one thing that we do know. That's really good information. 
Thank you, Dr. Braun. You have provided us with some valuable insights into the virus and why we must take the necessary precautions to stay COVID-19 negative. To our attendees who have just joined us, as a reminder, please remember to place your questions in the Zoom chat box or the Facebook comment section. We do really want to hear from you today. I want to shift and dive into understanding the virus from a biological perspective and what that means for patients. So essentially, how does COVID-19 make us sick? Dr. Malvastudo, um, if you could kind of walk us through that and what that looks like in patients if we were to get sick from COVID-19. Sure. Um, we have a slide that uh, actually goes over just the clinical presentation of COVID and then just to give you an idea and I can, I can explain it in, in, in the context of um, how um, uh, a patient may present and the types of symptoms that they may have. So we know that patients with COVID-19 will have, uh, will, there's a broad range of presentations and some patients will have very mild or even completely asymptomatic disease. Um, and then the other patients will have very severe disease that may be life-threatening. And as we know, you know, we are already well over 425,000 deaths um, nationally uh, due to COVID-19. Um, and we know that these, uh, the factors that make it more likely that somebody will progress to more severe disease um, are, those are at this point are actually relatively well known. So we can actually uh, recognize, you know, what those factors are and then who is more likely to progress to more severe disease. It doesn't always happen. Some patients may have risk factors and yet have relatively mild disease. And other patients who should be, you know, fairly healthy, uh, and young and healthy who can present with severe disease as well. Um, so when somebody is exposed to COVID, to the virus, um, they may not present with any symptoms for a period of time. There is an initial incubation period that may go anywhere from two days all the way up to pot, even 10 days. Uh, but generally within about five to seven days is when most patients after an exposure will experience uh, symptoms. And then you know, those symptoms may progress um, and then some will resolve, some will continue and stay on for a longer period of time. Um, but again, there is also a large segment of the population that will have no symptoms at all. And what we now know is that up to 50% of infections actually are come from other patients who are unaware that they themselves have COVID-19. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't just think that, well, you know, I am uh, in contact with somebody who has no symptoms, they don't have any fever, there's nothing going on, I'm sure they don't have COVID. There's actually no way to know unless somebody actually has a test result that was done. Um, so what are the symptoms? And then, and this is the, when people do present with symptoms, they, again, will vary quite a bit, but they can be as, uh, they could be chills, fever, Sore throat is relatively common. Um, a number of patients will present with cough and shortness of breath, uh, but yet other patients will not have any pulmonary symptoms at all. Uh, so they may not have any kind of cough. Something that we know is actually fairly specific in, in, and it can happen with other viruses, but that we've seen a lot with COVID is uh, the loss of the sense of uh, smell and taste. Um, and that's a symptom that can actually persist for, persist for quite a while. So even after somebody recovers from other symptoms, they may continue to experience that. Diarrhea is also relatively common in the first few days, but that may resolve in, uh, after two or three days. And then uh, disseminated, diffused body pain, muscle aches, uh, nausea, headaches, they can be, which can be pretty severe as well. Um, for most patients, these symptoms will clear within about two weeks. Uh, but then some patients, you know, will progress and may require hospitalization. Uh, and in that case, it would require a combination of treatments and possibly an intensive care and mechanical ventilation to survive. Um, some patients recover partially um, and, and then over time recover completely. But there is also a population of patients that we are learning more about whose symptoms may persist actually for uh, months. Um, and you know they've been termed uh, COVID-19 long haulers. Um, one of our patients, I, I don't know if uh, Jeffrey is uh, has, has been able to join, but he's had you know that issue for several months. He was hospitalized and has continued to have symptoms uh, for for quite a while. 
Um, so there can be uh, quite the broad presentation and the, what determines, you know, what, uh, how severe the presentation will be, will be uh, the risk factors that, that the person has. Do they have other comorbidities that would put them at higher risk of complications, as well as what were they exposed to, how much virus they were exposed to. So essentially, you know, the viral load that they're initially exposed to could determine also how quickly the disease will progress um, in, in that person. That, that's really good information. And so with that, if, have you seen, or from your perspective, can you tell us if there's a higher risk of complications for persons who are living with HIV? And as a clinician, what tools do you have to manage the illness? So uh, there have been several studies looking at HIV, uh, patients living with HIV, people living with HIV in different settings. Some of the initial studies, large studies that were conducted actually in New York City, uh, where we saw, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic in the U.S., uh, that a, a number of uh, people living with HIV were hospitalized. The data from those studies was actually encouraging in that it showed that um, people living with HIV were being hospitalized at the same rates as people without HIV, and that uh, the hospitalization and their course of the disease uh, was determined by their other risk factors. So it wasn't so much whether they had HIV or not, but if they had uh, also diabetes or, um, or heart disease, um, or if they were older than 65. So these are all the risk factors that we know for the general population would determine if they're gonna have a, a more severe course of disease. There have been more recent studies that have looked at you know, also uh, people living with HIV and that have shown that the population of patients with HIV whose CD4 counts are low, below 200, they are more likely to then require hospitalization and also to have other complications. Um, so fortunately, the majority of our patients have you know, good CD4 counts and are virally suppressed uh, and would not fall in that category. But for uh, patients whose CD4 counts are below 200, then uh, they need to be aware of the fact that you know, they are more likely to progress if they have disease. And there was a recent study in the UK that actually showed that mortality, when you looked at the overall uh, population of uh, people living with HIV, was increased, uh, but it's not completely clear. So what seems to come out of this is, you know, for the most part, um, people living with HIV, if their CD4 counts are good, will do as well uh, or as poorly as somebody without HIV, depending on their other risk factors. Um, but the other point that I think is important to bring up about this is that for a while there was a thought or there was a question as to whether the antiretrovirals that we use to treat HIV, if they were protective against COVID. And this is based on some data that was done in the laboratory showing that um, certain uh, drugs like tenofovir and even some of the old protease inhibitors like lopinavir actually had activity against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, but at the population level, that's not something that we have seen. So we don't at this time, we don't believe that uh, being on antiretrovirals uh, then is protective against COVID necessarily. Okay, so I'm hearing you say comorbidities are very important, as well as um, antiretroviral therapy will not be protective against um, COVID-19. So we've learned about COVID-19 from a biological perspective. And I wanted to give space to Jeffrey, if he has joined the call. Jeffrey, are you here to share your experience that you had with COVID-19? Okay, no problem. So I want to move forward and talk about the subject that's probably top of mind for many of our guests, vaccination. Um, so I know you're wondering if it's safe to take it, what version should you take? So there's Moderna, there's Pfizer, and there's several other vaccines in the clinical, clinical trials right now. And you're really just looking for additional certainty that the vaccine is what's best for you. So Dr. Malvasudo, we can continue the conversation at a high level. How do vaccines work? Sure. Um, and I think we have some slides that, were, that we can use to illustrate some of the points. You know, we won't get into uh, too much technical detail, but I think uh, if we can show uh, the one that shows the SARS-CoV-2 virus with the spike protein and I can explain. 
So in general, um, you know, while we're getting ready to put those up, uh, the vac a vaccine, the idea of a vaccine is that we are exposing our immune system to an antigen, um, and that may be uh, from a germ, uh, whether you know it's a virus or bacteria. That uh, and what you see here in this uh, slide is actually an electron micrograph of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, when you look at the surface of that of the virus, um, you see part of these tufts, um, and these are the spike proteins uh, of the virus. And this is actually the structure that the virus uses to attach to human cells to be able to enter those cells. Um, and then it starts its replication cycle um, and it makes, uh, it's able to make many copies of itself and those uh, uh, new variants will go on to infect other cells. You know, similarly to uh, what we know about HIV. Now, so you see that spike protein is particularly important for this virus because our immune system, when we're exposed to the virus, will uh, will detect the virus as a uh, as a uh, a foreign body as a as a germ, and then will make antibodies that will target the out the surface proteins of the virus. So in this case, the spike protein that's on the surface of the virus. So we can actually train our immune system to be ready to actually make those antibodies that will detect the virus, target it, and then um, uh, flag it for destruction um, by other cells that are part of our immune system. And we do this with lots of different viruses, you know, than the many vaccines that we have. And we can do the same thing for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So if we go on to uh, the next slide uh, after this, and I can show, so here, um, if you look at, you know, at the bottom, you see the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the spike protein on top of it, um, that little red area is the receptor binding domain. And then you see that an antibody is now attaching to the receptor binding domain. When an antibody attaches to that part of the, the um, spike protein, then the virus is unable to attach to the human cell and it cannot enter the cell. So we stop that cycle and that's, that's what we want. We wanna have those antibodies. So we wanna train our immune system to make those antibodies and have them ready to detect virus if we are exposed to it later on. Um, so, and this has also been used for treatment. We can actually make these antibodies in the lab now. Uh, these are called monoclonal antibodies and we can use that for treatment. Um, and it's something that we've been able to do um, and it's, uh, there are now approved treatments uh, under emergency use authorization for uh, people with risk factors to have more, uh, for complications of COVID-19. So if they do get COVID-19, then they can actually get an infusion of these antibodies that will protect them. But for everyone else, then what we want is for them to be vaccinated so that, so that if they're exposed to the virus in the future, then those antibodies will uh, take over and protect them. Um, I can show, if we go to uh, the cartoons of the two different types of, uh, or actually the COVID-19 vaccine slides that I'll show. Uh, so there are many different vaccines that are, have been in development. There's over 150 that have been in, the, in development around the world. And if we go to the next slide, I can show you that these are the vaccines that have been part of Operation Warp Speed. Um, so essentially the US government has uh, provided funding to accelerate the development of these vaccines. And the ones that you see at the, at the top, so the Moderna vaccine and now the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccines, these are mRNA vaccines that have already received uh, emergency use authorization. So they went through all the different stages of uh, uh, clinical trials. So phase one, phase two, and phase three. And now, and in the phase three, they've been shown to be very effective as well as safe. Um, if we go to the next slide, then I can summarize. So currently we have the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine. These are given in two doses. In the case of the Pfizer vaccine, um, they are 
uh, patients will uh, people will receive the first dose and then they will receive a booster 21 days later. In the case of the Moderna vaccine, uh, the booster is given uh, about a month later. After the second dose, we know from the, these very large clinical trials that were very well conducted um, that uh, the protection is excellent. It's actually uh, around 94 to 95%. And just to give you an idea, when before all of this started, so while the vaccines were in development, the threshold of efficacy that was set by the FDA to say, okay, this vaccine can move forward if it can show that it's at least 50% protective. That's what was said for all the vaccines. So, because we didn't know really how effective the, you know, they were going to be. But as a matter of fact, um, even 50% protection would have an impact on the pandemic. Uh, but in this case, what we see is that they're actually far more efficacious in the, you know, in the clinical trials, what we see is that it's 94 to 95% protection for both of these. Um, so, uh, which is fantastic. This is exactly what we wanted. Uh, and in terms of safety, very few serious adverse events were observed in the clinical trials. And at this point, you know, we've had more than 22 million doses given to date. I think it's actually closer to 24 million and only 40 or so serious allergic reactions have uh, taken place. And to put this in context, you know, well, what does that mean? I obviously, I don't want to get an, a serious allergic reaction. Um, but, uh, you know, when we think about the population and what is the risk of having a serious allergic reaction to penicillin, um, so a very common antibiotic, it's about one in 5,000. So, you know, so far, only 40 or so uh, serious allergic reactions out of you know, 24 million doses that have been given, you know, is really showing that we're not really seeing very much. There is, uh, you know, patients do experience mild, uh, so people who receive the vaccine, as uh, Dr. Brown knows, and, you know, I, I just got my second dose of the Moderna vaccine um, last week. Uh, so most people will actually experience a, some, uh, so they'll experience some, some pain at the site, um, uh, after the second shot, I had chills overnight, um, and uh, the next day I felt very achy, uh, but, it, you know, I was at work and I was fine, and by the day after that, I was totally okay, and that seems to be sort of the general experience for most people. Some people experience nothing, uh, so my wife, who's also a physician at Nationwide Children's, um, she had less um, uh, pain at the site of the injection than I did. And after the second injection, she didn't get any chills or anything else. Uh, so, you know, there will be some variation. Uh, Chad, what, what was it like for you? I, I wonder. Um, I can I can tell you it was, uh, and then I have a question, um, Carlos. But for you, um, but it was um, it was like a it was like a um, a challenging flu shot for me. So like you know sometimes when you get a little achy, a little pain, painy, and fatigued for a day. The next day I was totally fine. So the day that I got the shot, I could tell that I, that things weren't quite right. The next day I was at work seeing a, seeing a full day of patients. So that, that, um, so I'm not as looking forward to this afternoon as much as I was before, um, you talked there. <laughs> so I'm getting my second shot in about three hours. Um, I would say right now, the biggest question that I'm getting is I've had COVID, um, what, when should I get, should I get vaccinated? Um, and if so, when should, when should I get vaccinated? Um, yeah, actually, and I think that brings up, you know, let's talk about what, you know, what should we do if, uh, if we get COVID, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think there's a slide that we have, uh, Matthew, if you can put that up, uh, you know, what, uh, the one that says, what can I do if I get COVID-19? Um, so, you know, for most patients, they'll experience, you know, a relatively mild course. Um, but the important thing is to be aware of, you know, if you have risk factors that, you know, make you more likely to then progress, then you, there's two things that you should do. The moment that you start having symptoms, get tested. So find out, you know, if you do have COVID-19 or not. Um, and uh, if you have a positive test, then make sure that your doctor is aware of it. And if you have risk factors, then you qualify, even if your symptoms are very mild, for the monoclonal antibody treatment. Uh, so, and we do recommend that for patients with risk factors, because what we know about the monoclonal antibodies is that if you receive one infusion of the monoclonal antibodies, 
then you are you will clear the virus much more quickly and you are a lot less likely to progress to having severe disease. So there was uh, the study that um, data that was actually put out for the BLAZE-1 trial showed that the combination of uh, antibodies from uh, the uh, Lilly, um, that the rate of progression of disease or requiring of hospitalization was reduced by 70% in these high-risk individuals. So it is important to be aware that that option exists. And uh, the treatment is free because uh, this is actually treatment that was uh, purchased by the US government. So uh, nobody gets charged for receiving this and you get a single infusion of this. Now, what happens if somebody's had COVID? And so you had COVID um, and now, you know, you wonder, you know, I feel, I don't feel so, uh, uh, you know, I'm feeling sick, I'm having symptoms, but what is the point when I have to go to the ER, which I think is an important uh, point. What we recommend for patients is um, if you're test positive for COVID, get a pulse oximeter. And that's that little device that you see at the top of the slide. And you can get it uh, you know, online, you can buy it on Amazon, you can really get it anywhere. They're about $20 or so, some a little cheaper, you know, some a little more, but all you need is a, just a regular pulse oximeter. And that will measure the level of oxygen in your blood. And you put it on your finger and it actually looks at, you know, it gives you, um, your, uh, uh, the percentage of oxygen. If that level drops below 93% and it's consistent like that, um, that's probably the time when you should consider you know, going to the ER because you may be getting to the point where you're, not, uh, uh, you're unable to oxygenate uh, your body properly the way that you should. And you don't want that to progress. Um, but if you're, you know, your oxygen saturation is, is fine, is 98%, 99%, you're just achy, then you may not really need to go to the hospital. You, you know, you just stay at home, you can take medication. So going back to your question. So what about, you know, I've had COVID, um, should I get vaccinated later on? The recommendation is yes, to uh, get vaccinated. However, what we tell patients is that you will probably have immunity for a period of time. How long? We think that at a minimum, you'll be immune for probably about three months. We have seen reinfection, and we, um, but we've never seen it in anybody in less than three months, okay? So for at least three months, you will be protected. But if you have the option of getting the vaccine, and you know, then, uh, then you should definitely go for it. What we do know is that the vaccines, uh, at least the ones that have been approved so far, will actually uh, induce the production of higher levels, higher titers of those neutralizing antibodies than natural infection in most cases. And in fact, for people who have relatively mild disease, they may only produce very relatively low levels of antibodies. So to make sure that people have the maximum protection, the recommendation is everyone should get vaccinated, even patients who had COVID-19. Um, if you just had COVID, wait until you fully recover, and then, you know, you can wait a couple of months and then get it at that point. Dr. Malvacito, I want to thank you for all of that information regarding the vaccine. It was excellent. Um, I just wanted to bring up an important point, important point at this point, um, as on a personal level, as a pharmacist, also as a Black female patient, the skepticism around government-sponsored vaccines. Um, I know that we all know at this point that the rollout of the vaccines has been far from efficient, um, that, but we are hopeful that with this new administration, the, pro the production and the dissemination of vaccines will be enhanced. Um, from my perspective, um, I know that there are a lot of Black and Latinx folks that are re reluctant to get the COVID-19 vaccine. And I think that that lack of trust is really rooted in systemic racism and also some health inequities that have put minority groups at risk. And so I wanted to debunk some myths that have come along. There's a slide, if we could get that slide up. Um, but before we went there, I wanted to ask Brandon if he could, I've gotten both, I've gotten the first dose of the Moderna vaccine, tolerated it well, but Brandon Chapman is on the call um, and is, has also received the vaccine. And I wanted to hear your thoughts, Brandon, on um, your vaccine experience. Hello, um, I was trying to share my video. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, my experience was um, very smooth. Um, as a 
I'm a public health administrator, um, LGBTQ health uh, program manager at Columbus Public Health. I felt like that it was my um, duty um, to really be an ambassador of public health um, for it. And so um, it was very fast for me. I will say um, one day I was sitting at my computer and I got an email that says that if you want to get a vaccination, go now. Um, and so I went um, and I didn't really hit me until I got to the 17th um, Avenue um, exit, like, oh God, I really am doing this. But I had did all the science for it. And I had talked to my primary care physician about it and to make sure that it was the right thing for me. Uh, and Dr. Marvel Studios said, definitely. We just had a conversation probably in December. Um, and just for that, he was like, definitely. And I definitely, I would need for you to speak about your experience. Um, and my experience uh, was very well. Um, again, I work at Columbus Public Health, uh, went through and it was kind of like a drive through saying, hey, everyone. Um, and the person uh, was talking to me, like really just gave me the vaccination and it was just like, we're done. Um, and so afterwards, we waited about 15 minutes. Um, and that 15 minutes, I socially saw some people who we haven't saw in a long time. We all had our windows down, you know, like, hey, you know, excited about the day that we will all be together, um, be able to do the work that we do. Um, and then when I went home, um, I was a little fatigued. Um, throughout the day, um, I, I got a little sleepy watching MSN, NBC, um, but then it was okay. Um, and so I'm scheduled again to take the vaccination um, probably next week. And um, I will do it in some time that allows myself, my body to rest, uh, because I know that as soon as I'm fully vaccinated, um, then my job will be out um, helping other people to really just spread the message and or make sure that logistically that you can get your vaccination and that we're providing you good customer service. So it's what we do. Um, I did the, the, the research um, and it's as an LGBTQ health program manager, I, I really, really um, suggest that everyone gets it, uh, especially if you're dealing with any core mobilities. Um, it is really a right thing for you. I tell people on Facebook all the time, um, I will, I, I made a decision to protect my health and I made a decision to protect others' health as well um, too. Brandon, thank you so much for your, your transparency. I think that's gonna be super helpful as individuals make the decision if they wanna take the vaccine or not. Um, I will say that black and brown folks cannot afford to not take it. Um, in the United States, You know, we're disproportionately affected in two ways. Um, if we get, get COVID-19, we likely will be hospitalized and then that often leads to death. So I think that these messages are super important to lift and raise. So thank you so much for that. Dr. Malvasudo, a couple of things I wanted you to dispel, a couple of myths that I wanted to ask you. And if you could um, speak to, you know, the fact that these are just not true. So the first, first myth is that COVID-19 vaccines will alter my DNA. The second is that the vaccines were made using fetal tissue. The third is that COVID-19 vaccine is not safe because it was rapidly tested and developed. And the last myth is that COVID-19 can affect women's fertility. So if you could just touch on those briefly for our audience today. Sure. Um, so the question, the first one is actually something that I think uh, in the, um, for some, you know, it's something that the, the anti-vax, uh, uh, folks out there are really trying to instill a lot of fear about the fact that the mRNA um, in the vaccines can somehow alter the DNA. And biologically, that's actually not possible. I can show that there's a, uh, a little um, figure on the how the mRNA vaccines work. And I'm just going to uh, show one point on that. Uh, if we can show that slide. Um, and then, but to explain that the mRNA actually is, uh, the, is injected into, this, into uh, the muscle, so in the deltoid muscle, and then that mRNA is actually encodes the instructions to make the spike protein. And so it will serve as a template. Um, and I you know, don't want you guys to be like, don't, don't worry about the, the details, but if you look at the, the panel at the very top, on the top left, so these are lipid nanoparticles and they include, uh, and then they have mRNA in the center. Those uh, nanoparticles are, so that's the vaccine. That mRNA is then goes inside the cell. So this is the cell, but you'll notice that there's a little circle in the bottom here, and that's the nucleus. That's where the, your, the cell DNA is located. 
the mRNA never goes into the nucleus. As a matter of fact, it cannot make its way into the nucleus at all. It would have to be converted or reverse transcribed into DNA, and then it would need some sort of vehicle, and actually in the case of the virus, is a, a nucleocapsid to be able to enter the nucleus. So biologically, it's not possible for mRNA to enter the nucleus and then alter the DNA in any way. So what it does is the mRNA will actually sit in the, in the cytosol of the cell, and then the ribosomes, uh, which are the, the protein factories of our cells, will come along, they'll see the mRNA, and they'll start making the protein encoded by the mRNA template, which is actually the spike protein. Those spike proteins are the little spikes, uh, red spikes that you see, that will then be on the surface, and then uh, those are um, then taken up by antigen-presenting cells, which are then uh, will activate T helper cells, and then uh, uh, as well as B cells that will produce antibodies. So these are the neutralizing antibodies that we want, um, and then the T helper cells that will come and actually, when you're actually exposed to the virus, will come and destroy that virus later on. So the for myth number one, this cannot happen. There is no way that the mRNA, and by the way, the mRNA is degraded within about two days. Uh, so, you know, it, it, during that period of time, uh, the spike proteins are made, then it's degraded and completely gone. So that number one cannot happen. Let's go back to the other one so I can address. Um, if you could just maybe address one more, Dr. Ravasuda, we have a lot of really good questions right. that I'm gonna get to. Um, so whatever, you would like to address. Yeah, can you show them to me again, just so I can? I, I would suggest the fertility one. Right, okay. <laughs> that so, one is the other one I hear, that I hear a lot, if you're only gonna do one, Carlos. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, and th this is a good one. So number one, um, and this unfortunately always happens that because uh, pregnant women are considered a vulnerable population, then for uh, unfortunately, they're not included in the initial clinical trials, right? Um, so we know that, uh, and this is actually, even though the American College on, uh, from Obstetrics and Gynecology, you know, recommends that they be included in all the trials from the beginning, pregnant women and children are not included. Um, so the, in all the trials, the inclusion and exclusion criteria require that participants not get pregnant or get somebody pregnant during the trial. However, human beings are human beings. So even trial participants are human beings. So there were a lot of pregnancies that actually happened in all the clinical trials for the vaccines. So we know for a fact that, you know, uh, that women were able to get pregnant, you know, getting the vaccine. And then the outcomes of those uh, pregnancies were followed, of course. And there, were, there have been no issues with the pregnancies or deliveries. So, so far, you know, we haven't seen and any, any uh, issues with fertility or issues with pregnancy. And uh, because of this, then the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that all pregnant women get the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines that have been approved, because the outcomes, um, when you weigh the risks and benefits, we know that COVID-19 in the setting of pregnancy will affect pregnancy. It will lead to complications of pregnancy. It will make it more likely that a pregnant woman would have uh, more complications with COVID and require hospitalization, as well as it, would, it will affect the outcome of the birth and it's more likely to result in premature births. So because of that, the recommendation is pregnant women should get uh, 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 vaccinated. So we- And then Olivia, I'm gonna go off script just for a second and I know you're doing great to keep us on time, but the, the, I know we're gonna get questions about the speed of development. Yeah. So Carlos, if you could do like, like 30 seconds right. on, on speed, that would be great. So the important point here is that the whole process for these vaccines and their Operation Warp Seed has been completely transparent. So we've known the protocols for the vaccine trials way before even the vaccines, uh, the trials started. We know exactly what the endpoints were and we've, uh, we've seen the data. As a matter of fact, uh, the advisory committee uh, meetings for FDA you know, were, uh, streamed live and you can actually look at the entire report uh, for each of these vaccines. But no steps were skipped. So this is important. The phase one trials were done, phase two trials were done, phase three trials were done. Um, so each one actually had all the outcomes. The difference is that normally 
to do a 30,000 or 44,000 uh, participant trial, it takes us well over a year to enroll that trial. In this case, these trials were done at hundreds of sites at the same time. So we were able to enroll these uh, trials quickly. The trials also depend on the number of events, how many people get infected. And unfortunately, or I guess fortunately for the trials, because there was so much COVID transmission in the community, we were able to actually accrue enough events, enough people getting infected in the placebo arms and the active arms to see the difference in a relatively short period of time. So none of the steps were skipped at any point. Um, and in fact, you know, everything was done the way that we would normally for any other vaccine. But because of the, the fact that they were, these trials were done, started at the same time, enrolled at the same time at many, many sites, and the fact that there was so much COVID, then we were able to get the results. Excellent. As we prepare to take questions, I just want to thank Drs. Braun and Malvasudo for sharing your expertise with us today. It was literally phenomenal. I learned so much. And I want to also give a huge thank you to Brandon for sharing his story with us. As we prepare to take questions, there's so many. So I want to start, and I'm gonna pose these to both Drs. Braun and Malvastudo, if you can jump in. Uh, the first question is understanding that the purpose of the vaccine is to solicit a body's, the body's immune response. Is there any evidence that pre-medicating with ibuprofen or Tylenol would then decrease the effectiveness of the vaccination? And then once um, a patient gets home, are they able to treat with Tylenol, ibuprofen, um, for people who have spiked fevers post-vaccine up to 102? Yeah, so I can, I can give you the answer. And this is more theoretical than based on actual data. The recommendation is to not pre-medicate. And the idea is that uh, that cytokine release and then that initial response, immune response, you don't want to attenuate that in, in any way. Uh, but after you get the vaccine, then, you know, if, uh, and it will be several hours before you experience some of the other symptoms, you can actually take uh, anti-inflammatories or acetaminophen. I did, and, uh, you know, I took uh, 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 ibuprofen actually after, uh, I think the night, um, I got the, my first shot at 1 p.m., and I think that night I took uh, uh, ibuprofen both times. So, uh, and in the trials, uh, that was actually allowed. So most people, uh, in fact, did take uh, acetaminophen and, and, uh, and NSAIDs. And the results that we see, that efficacy of 94, 95% was seen with that having been used. So it's okay to do that. I think it's important to know that, that, the, um, that the, the side effects that what we're calling from the vaccine is, is really sort of the, the body mobilizing the immune response to the vaccine. Okay, so it's like, it's almost like a good sign in a way that, yeah. All right. Yeah, okay, absolutely. I, I think it's a, you know, in fact, uh, uh, that's exactly what I was, you know, what I was telling, uh, I was describing, you know, because when I got it, I told my, my wife, well, you know, my immune system is clearly responding to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's, it, you know, you, you can, you can feel it working uh, for sure. <laughs> Awesome. So if you were to get vaccinated with the Moderna first, is it possible to get Pfizer to finish up that course or is it important to, to stay consistent with what you're getting? So we don't have data on sort of mixed uh, vaccines. It is something that is actually being looked at, you know, because it could happen in some situations. Theoretically, I believe that it's probably okay because essentially, you know, the first vaccine will prime the immune system the second one will give you that booster. So, uh, but the, we don't have data showing that, you know, it will work exactly the same way. So the recommendation is whichever one you got first, you know, you should get the same one second. And that's the way that we're doing it in Ohio. We're making it very clear. And then we've actually made sure that there's enough uh, vaccine for that second dose that it's, so that it's exactly the same as what you got the first time. Awesome. And so there are some listeners who have teenagers who do not uh, fit the age requirement, but their weight um, kind of classifies them in, in an adult class classification. Um, what are your thoughts on them getting the vaccine and should they get vaccinated and how is that gonna work going forward? Right, so the data and uh, the emergency use authorization was approved for Pfizer down to age 16. Uh, for Moderna, it's 18 and above. Um, so, the, the 
you know, so if your child is 16, then they can get the Pfizer vaccine right now. Uh, the trials actually on the pediatric populations are currently ongoing. So they're actually happening right now and they're going all the way down to infants, in fact. Um, but, you know, we won't have the data for, for a little while in that population. Fortunately, because those, that population is younger, then generally, you know, they, they tend to uh, do okay. Um, so, but if, let's say, you know, you have a teenager who's 14 and right now wouldn't qualify for either one, but they have certain risk factors, then the important thing is until, you know, one of these vaccines is approved for that age group is to be aware that if they have risk factors, they may be able to get, if they do get COVID, then the monoclonal antibody. Right. So at least be aware that's an option. You know, if my, you know, teenage child who's, you know, 13, 14, um, who, you know, is diabetic or um, has a, a history of a, a, a respiratory disease, then this may be an option that exists for them. That's really, really good information. For transgender folks who bind their chest, should they be particularly worried about COVID complications? based on the impact that it could have on their lungs? Hmm. I, I, I mean, I think if you're, if you're actively sick with COVID and you're having problems breathing, you shouldn't bind your chest, okay? So, I mean, I, I, I think we can, we, can, we can definitely say that. Um, I think you know, the long-term impact of COVID on the lungs, we don't really know yet. Most people, re, um, most people re recover pretty quickly. I've had some patients that have had persistent shortness of breath, persistent cough that are on inhalers for a few months. Um, I would say if you're having increased trouble breathing after having COVID when you're binding than you were having prior to, that you might want to talk about that with your provider and, and figure out a plan because you, you, it might just take a little time or there might be some medications that you can use that can help with your lung function. So I, I think that's how I would answer that question. Um, Olivia, I did see one other question that I want to, yeah. that I want to, um, that I want to address. And that was about the, so two things about the pulse ox. One, and we know everybody doesn't have a pulse ox. Um, if, if somebody can, if you can find somebody that has a pulse ox, find somebody that has a pulse ox, um, and have, have them help you out. Know that there are two numbers on most pulse ox. Um, one is the, one is the actual pulse and one is the oxygenation level. So don't get those mixed up, okay? Because that might, um, that might, that might uh, impact what you're gonna do. But if you don't have a pulse ox, the things to look at, if, if, you're, if you're having significant trouble breathing, persistent pain um, and, or pressure in the chest, if you're having any confusion or bluish lips or face or uh, like trouble staying awake, I mean, those those are things to look at that your respiratory status might be um, might be getting worse. So if you can't use a pulse ox, people feel really bad with COVID. Um, you can feel really bad and still have a pulse ox of ninety eight or ninety nine percent. So you know it, it it it's hard to go by that, but those are the symptoms that you can look for if you can't follow your blood oxygen level at home. Are there any other questions in the chat, Dr. Braun, that you see that would you want to address? We, we have time for one or two more questions before we end the call today. I'm just gonna look. Uh, There's a quick one as far yeah. as, you know, if you take a 10 oil atorvastatin yeah. level thyroxine daily, should you take these medications the day of your vaccine? Yeah, take your regular back, uh, medications as you would on any other day. Don't skip just for the, the vaccine. Yeah, and, I, and from a vaccine perspective, there's great, and you know, th th this rollout is going the way that it's going. And, um, you know, but in Ohio, uh, it runs through Ohio Department of Health and through the health departments and then down through the medical centers and different pharmacies. Ohio Department of Health has a website that shows you where vaccine is available. Um, and Carlos might know this a little faster than me, but we know about a day or two faster than you guys when the next, um, <laughs> when the next tier is coming out and, and how we're gonna determine who's gonna be in that tier. And I know there was a question, Carlos, about in the next tier, it's going to be people that have comorbid conditions. You know, um, 
how is that going to be determined? Like, do you need a note? I mean, do we have an idea of what that's going to look like yet? Yeah. So that's being discussed right now. So obviously we don't, you know, we're not going to be requiring uh, that you present uh, specific proof. Uh, but for example, for our patients at OSU that we're vaccinating at the Schottenstein, so we have their medical history, um, and then we're able to determine that. What I would recommend to, to people is, you know, connect with uh, your uh, primary care provider if you have one. If you don't have one, then you can still get vaccinated and we will get you vaccinated. But um, if you have one and you're particularly worried about this, you know, does my current condition then qualify me under, um, you know, one of these comorbid high-risk conditions. Um, and then your provider will have a, a sense as to, you know, whatever system they're connected to of, you know, what that will mean for you. Uh, and they can actually help you to navigate that. Um, so, you know, and it may be several weeks down the road and that's okay. Um, but, you know, at least if uh, we can start doing that homework and sort of getting prepared for that. Uh, so I have a number of my patients who have asked me this question. So, I'll, you know, I'm trying to figure out where they fit in, uh, not just because of their age group, but also because of the comorbidities that they have. And to be honest, you know, that that hasn't been determined yet. So it's not like there's very clear of uh, these patients, you know, will go at this point, but we can certainly make a case, um, you know, for patients. And when we were talking about HIV in general, uh, what we think is going to happen is that, you know, for uh, people living with HIV with C4 comes under 200, they may be in this uh, uh, priority category, whereas, uh, you know, most of our patients with good CD4 counts will not necessarily be, and not, that's because, again, the data don't really support right now, um, you know, uh, prioritizing beyond uh, the other risk factors. Uh, this may change as we get more data, but this is what we know right now. So, so from what you just said, um, Carlos, no concern with people with HIV getting the vaccination. No, no. And actually, and this is a very important point. The same thing, you know, has been asked about what about somebody with cancer? What about somebody with autoimmune disease? As a matter of fact, you know, um, if you have risk factors, or if you have certain conditions, the recommendation is even uh, stronger for you to get the vaccine. Um, you know, and I've had, for example, I've had transplant patients, right, whose immune system is very depleted. Um, and, uh, you know, well, what if we don't, uh, they won't mount as robust an immune response. That may be true, but some immune response will be protective as opposed to no immune response. And because of the, the risk of COVID and the complications of COVID is so high, then we still recommend vaccination. Um, but we don't expect, and we haven't seen in any of the trials, any complications because somebody had HIV or because they were taking certain medications. Uh, so as a matter of fact, you know, uh, people living with HIV in the majority of trials, if they had CD4 counts above 200, they were, you know, included uh, on every uh, ART regimen you can imagine. Uh, even, you know, we've had patients even with, uh, with uncontrolled HIV, and there has been no, uh, no negative outcomes that would make us say, oh, you should not get the, the vaccine. So don't wait. If you have a chance to get the vaccine, then you should get it. Don't wait just because, you know, and if you do have other conditions, even more reason for you to get the vaccine. Yeah. I, I, absolutely on that. Get it where you can get it, when you can get it. And, and there's going to be a certain amount of navigation um, that that's rewarded for that, you know, persistence. Um, there was a question about um, uh, the risk of a vaccinated person seeing a vaccinated family member like a grandparent. Um, so both, pe both sets of people have been vaccinated. Right. Well, then that's the ideal situation, right? right. Um, so, uh, and I think that the, what the question is probably getting to is the fact that we don't have proof yet um, that the vaccine necessarily uh, prevents uh, somebody from having some virus that is replicating. But uh, what we know is that it definitely protects them from having symptomatic disease and severe disease. Uh, so if you had the vaccine, then you're probably fully protected from having severe disease. Is it possible that if I test that person after they were exposed that there may be some level of virus that is circulating? Yes. Is it possible that they could pass it on to others? Maybe, we don't really know. But you have two people who have been vaccinated, so at a minimum, you know that their uh, probability of them having severe disease or even symptomatic disease is 
very minimal, if any. Yeah. So that's the ideal situation. And that, yeah. that's why we encourage, you know, that may be the time when we tell people, you know, okay, you, I know you've been waiting to see your grandparents or, uh, yeah. or your elderly parents. Uh, so get them vaccinated, number one, so that they're protected. And then, you know, you yourself also get vaccinated, but then that, that may be the, the perfect kind. That's and when that, you can actually do that. I think it's important on that with, with what Dr. Malva Studio said is the vaccine doesn't mean that you can't get COVID. I mean, you still can, it's, 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 it's rare. Um, but the, the, in the studies, severe disease was very, very rare, if even present at all. So if you got the vaccine, the people that were getting severe COVID was negligible. Um, as, yeah, uh, in fact, in, in the active arm of the studies, you know, it, severe disease was just not seen. Symptomatic disease was only seen, you know, in a very small percentage, but, you know, there was no severe disease in those who got who were vaccinated. So for the individuals who are on the call, there was a slide to um, give the resource as the, for the Ohio Department of Public Health. If you have any questions on how to get access to the vaccine, we're currently in phase 1B, but I did want to drop that resource as we end our call today. I wanna thank everyone for joining us. I ho we hope that you feel more educated now to make an informed decision about the vaccine. Um, we hope that you feel equipped with ways to keep your family safe. Um, and hopefully you got a lot of information on how COVID-19 affects the LGBTQ plus communities. If you do have additional questions, I apologize we weren't able to get to everyone. Please email info at equitashealth.com. Again, we thank you all for joining us this, today, and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, guys.